So because we have so much variety and so much complexity and so many parts that are interacting in very non-obvious ways, we have to choose a model. We have to choose a vital few. One, one of the first things I taught students when we were doing mathematics in Berkeley is, you know, you, you don't build a model to represent reality. You build a model to answer a question. Because if you build a model to represent reality, you're going to get back reality. The best model would be perfect and therefore perfectly useless. Uh, Jorge Luis Borges, an Argent I'm from Argentina, so I'm very f I like Borges a lot. Uh, he, he wrote a lot about these things, and he has a, a wonderful story called The Map of Babylon. And he tells the story that the emperor of Babylon wanted a map that was really accurate. So the scribes went and worked for years, and they brought a map that was very intricate, very delicate, very well done, but he said, oh, my empire is not like this, it has to be better. And while well, it kept going like this, make a long story short, well, they made a perfect map where every rock was a rock in the map, every tree was a tree in the map, and it was a perfect map, and therefore perfectly useless. Because what makes a map useful is that it's not perfect, is that you have deleted all the information except the one that you consider relevant to answer a particular problem. So, all of us, we build models, we use maps to navigate, and the maps we build, however, but the maps we build, are not simply representations of the territory. They are the maps that we build because we want to navigate this territory in a particular way. So if I have a car, I will make a different map than you that have a sailboat. And if you have a, an airplane, you're going to make a different map than either the sailboat or the car. Or if you want to go by subway, you're going to go for a different map than the other people, and so on. So I, I'll tell you what is, in my mind, the, the most grim, the most terrible, the most devastating and depressing part of organizational life. And it's a fairly abstruse model, but when people understand what it means, everybody starts crying. And this is the problem. The problem is that in order to optimize a system, you have to sub-optimize the subsystems. And if you try to optimize any subsystem, you will sub-optimize the system. Let me say that in English now. If you want the whole to work as best as it can, the parts will not do their best. If any part tries to do the best, it will make it difficult for the whole to operate with the highest level of efficiency, effectiveness, survivability, resiliency, whatever quality you like about the system as a whole. Now, why is this so terrible? Well, this is terrible because in organizations, people get measured and compensated for the way they run their subsystems. Okay? You, this, is, this is a very, very problematic uh, conflict in incentive theory. If you wanted to run an organization to, to achieve a global optimum, then you would compensate every person Ba and you could observe what every person does, you would compensate every person based on their contribution to the global optimality of the system. But since there are a lot of variables that are hidden, private information, uh, effort, things that you cannot observe, then when you give incentives that are completely global, you create a free rider problem. The free rider problem is that people can shirk. So for example, if everybody pays taxes. The best, the best state of the world is everybody pays taxes, I use social services, and I don't pay taxes. So I cheat on my taxes. Everybody else pays. Now, that would be great, but everybody thinks the same. It's called the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, you may have heard this in game theory. Then nobody pays taxes, and we're all worse off. So how do we get all to pay taxes? Well, then you need uh, you know, a tax authority that has enough power to put people in jail. Otherwise, nobody would pay. Well, nobody, not nobody, but over time, nobody would end up paying because even people who feel that they need to pay, over time, they would see that other people don't pay and they do better. So they would, uh, evolutionarily, the system would drift to a situation where nobody pays any taxes and there's no social services and no government. And some people would say that's too bad, but anyway, that's a different presentation. So the problem is you have to compensate or organizations compensate people based on the performance of their local subsystems. So you can get into situations where people are not doing the best for the whole, they're trying to game their measures, they're trying to get the best reward they can for their incentives and their incentives are not geared to make the best for the system as a whole. So 
here's how we get to this issue that different people will make different maps because they're trying to optimize different things. If you're in manufacturing and trying to reduce cost, it's very different than if you're in design and you're trying to maximize the reach, as they say in the auto industry, or, or maximize the admiration of the design community. Or if you're in engineering and you want to have the latest feature in your product and you want a very advanced, technologically superb product. So every organization will start optimizing different things. And now you have an organization where people are operating with different maps. However, the real, not the real problem, what I'm going to call the problem or the big problem is not that people operate with maps. The problem is that each one of those people will say, this is not a map, this is the territory. This is the way things are. Let me tell you what the real problem is. Have you heard that? Now we need to talk about the real. That's not the real problem. This is the real problem. What the hell is, there's no such thing as a real problem. A problem, it's a way I call things I don't like, a state of affairs that displeases me and I would like to change. But there's no reality in that except my own opinion that this is not good for me. Maybe great for others. So my cavity is my dentist's business. So is the cavity a problem? Well, it's a problem for me because it hurts and I have to pay to fix it, but it's a great business opportunity for the dentist. So well, when the dentist has a problem, now it's a, uh, sorry, when the dentist has a cavity, now it's a problem for him. But saying cavities are a problem, it's meaningless. No, nothing is a problem. So we already know that representations are not reality. So that's in art, it's obvious this is not a pipe, this is not even a representation of a pipe. But the problem is that when we see this, it literally blows our mind. It's like, what, what kind of world do we live in? It's, it's like somebody's pulling the rug from under you and saying, you know, everything you know, everything you see, it's not out there. How many have seen The Matrix? I just want to check if I can use that as a reference. Okay, about more than half. So in the, in the movie The Matrix, this is exactly what happens. So Morpheus, who's um, the, the, the character that brings Neo, the, the, the main character, out of The Matrix, and shows him the truth. Morpheus says, do you want to know, do you want to really know what the matrix is? And when he shows the matrix to Neo, or explains the concept of the matrix, Neo, if anybody remember, he pukes and passes out. I mean, that, he, he vomits, he just gets sick, and then passes out and faints. That, that's what happens. So it's quite shocking for people who live in a naive, realistic, or modern world to realize Oh my God, this is, this is a matrix, but it's really a matrix. It's not a movie, it's not science fiction. The world is not out there. The world you experience is not what's out there. Maybe for you, this is nothing, but when I, when I started thinking about that, I thought I was going crazy. Wait a minute, but then how can we say anything about anything? It, it's a little bit like uh, quantum physics, when you say, well, you know, if you keep looking and looking, at the end there's nothing. There's only probability waves. Well, but why doesn't everything fall through everything? That's why I wanted to ask. I mean, it's crazy. If, 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 if atoms are not solid and there's only energy, well, why? why uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really weird. Anyway, I don't have an answer, but that's how I feel. <laughs>